Namaste and good evening to members and guests of ICDA. Welcome to another evening of uh, the online series that we have been holding for past two years continuously. I'll take a minute uh, to introduce uh, this guest that we have today. Let me quote uh, what was uh, written in uh, first post when they carried an article last week. Starting from the age of five, Bharatanatyam dancer Geeta Chandran has spent more than half a century teaching and performing the classical dance which has proved to be her constant paramour and consort. She still remains in an unceasing learning phase with the humble thought in her mind that one life is not enough to fully understand it. After a hiatus of 30 months forced upon by the COVID pandemic, this visionary and celebrated artist recognized for her work in theatre, dance, education, video and films, performed live at Delhi, where she premiered her new works in In Search of Infinity, with performances choreographed and compiled based on what she experienced in the past 30 months of the pandemic period. She included compositions like that of legendary Hindi poet Sri Jay Shankar Prasad, as a potent metaphor for the dark days of the pandemic that need to be put aside as new day rises, but with abundant caution. This evening, she talks to us about her multiple journeys through Bharatanatyam, physical, cerebral and philosophical. I cut short uh, the introduction with the uh, innocent intention of uh, getting to spend more time with her. Geeta ma'am, uh, good evening and welcome to ICDA. Namaste. In um, getting us all together, because we are quite a scattered lot and we seem to be, uh, in a sense, in isolation, creating work and uh, doing our own little bit. But the sense of community has grown uh, during the pandemic and uh, uh, I, I have managed to reach, reach many, many different groups through uh, my interactions, through workshops, through talks, through lectures, through demonstrations, etc. So I think this has been an interesting time where um, uh, somebody sitting somewhere in the globe can still connect and be part of the journey of somebody else or learn something um, <clears throat> sitting somewhere else. So uh, we should thank the pandemic for certain things that it has uh, taught us and we've become much more techno savvy that's the other thing because technology was something that particularly my generation was particularly had a mental block towards and i think i came over that overcame that and um, today i uh, am much more comfortable with technology and talking to just the lens in spite of not having a live audience or getting any kind of feedback from um, people around so having said that uh, the title that um, I had circulated was My Search for Infinity. And uh, I think uh, we are all in a search mode right now because we're all searching. And I think it's a good thing because uh, searching leads us somewhere. If we stop searching, I think we are dead. So search is something that constantly we all need to do and we are doing in our own way. So uh, why infinity? Because it's my recent work and I will use this phrase infinity there because during the pandemic, I think everything around us was had a life. Even our own lives had an ending in a sense. So everything had become very finite and very, very definite. So I think we all looked for sources where we could replenish energy and we could replenish that, that, that uh, sense of hope from where would it come. So I think we all went inwards 
I did. I suffered COVID twice and um, I had to come out of it. So um, I think I was constantly looking for that energy within. And then I realized that that energy within each one of us is truly infinite. And it is a huge uh, source that we all need to tap into. And how do we tap into is uh, a reason, a, a something that we all need to figure it out for ourselves because each one has a different journey. Each one is in a, in a, in a, in a different state in their careers, in, in the graph, in different age groups. So everybody has a certain frame of reference into which they dip into to kind of find that strength. But how I did it was I listened to a lot of music. It was extremely therapeutic, which I always do. But I was listening to six to seven hours of music. I was uh, kind of completely, um, in a sense, um, um, yeah, engulfed by music, you know, all kinds of music, particularly classical music. And um, I was trying to find meaning even in a raga cadence or in a tanam or in a swara pattern is there something that i can find in terms of movement in terms of translating that into expression translating that so it is just nothing concrete but i was just kind of filling myself up with lots and lots of wonderful things and reading i think that was the next thing that i did i read a lot and I tried to put my thoughts down. I was writing as well. So I think these things really helped me get that energy. And I was creating stuff without a deadline, which was again beautiful. And there were lots of work that I had begun and not finished. So I took all that, sat and had tons of work to do, which I had uh, started and not finished or not performed. So this was all the kind of thing that I did during the pandemic and created things which were much more leisurely, much more introspective, um, much more um, ponderous. So I think that was what the, the program that you mentioned just which happened uh, in Delhi. That's why I chose those pieces and I strung them together into an evening so that uh, it could uh, kind of put, put it out there. Unless you kind of perform, you don't know how these pieces are going to have a life of their own. So I needed to kind of give birth in a sense. It was all in my room. So I had to bring it out and put it in front of an audience. And it was very, very gratifying to see that people were moved and it was nice to get that feedback. And there's still, I have emails coming in about the program and what they took back and it's interesting because many things that I didn't actually think of the audience really gave back to me in terms of feedback so it was very 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 interesting uh, now coming back to this lecture I really don't know my audience I know it's a very mixed audience but I just thought my thoughts over the last few uh, weeks have been in this line so I just thought I would kind of pose these questions why do we dance is dance particularly Bharatanatyam a classical dance like Bharatanatyam reflecting who the dancer is is it reflecting that is dance becoming boring and if it is why what is excellence in dance can we define it are there some parameters for it how do we train and has the pedagogy of dance evolved with time? So these are some of the questions that have been bothering me in the last few uh, weeks. So I just thought I would kind of touch on these and see and try and make sense for, um, I don't know if it would interest you or not, but I just thought that these were questions that were being asked many, many times to me, which were asked of me and which are perennial because every generation has to address these questions because as we evolve in dance, as we move in dance, as 
time passes by, our audiences are changing, the context is changing, the venues are changing, the presentation techniques are changing, everything is changing and evolving, not changing, evolving. So, and it has to, because I think nothing is forever in a, in a particular mold. So our great teachers did what they did because at that particular time in history, in a sociological context, that was important and that had to be done. And we, at, in our times, need to address other sets of questions, may not be the same set of questions, but some other sets of questions which are um, kind of all the time facing us and we need to. So first thing is, why do we dance? Uh, this is, I think, something that everybody needs to ask themselves. As to why do you dance? I asked all my students to write essays on why, why they dance. Every six months or at least once a year they write. Because I think it's very important when you embark on a journey to understand why you have undertaken this journey and what is it that you are or not getting out of it so i think it's i i think all of you should you should write about why do you dance so i can say for myself why i dance i didn't begin to dance with the idea of my becoming a dancer i danced i learned to dance because my mother took me to um my first teacher shrimati swarna sarswati at the age of five and I formally started training in dance. And the training was very intense. It was three times a week, many hours. And it was very immersive in a sense because there was music, there was Veena, there was uh, Abhinaya, there was, of course, dance. There was all aspects, Natuangam. We had to do everything. We had to teach the next, the next uh, group of dancers who had come in. So it was a continuous process. And there was nothing like set in stone. Every class we evolved and the same padam would be done by three different people in three different ways in the class. It was not as though it was a set piece that everybody did it uh, in the same way. So the pedagogy was a certain way and uh, it was not geared towards performance, I would say. It was, it was, as I said, it was immersive and what you took from it was up to you. So it was not handed to you as a complete piece and said that now you can learn it, you can practice it, you can, I mean, you can perform it, you can teach it. It's not as though it was a frame given to you like that. Uh, you were given the broad strokes and you had to work on it. And each one to his own capacity would really fill in the colors and bring one's own individual uh, personality into the dance. So I think that was the initial uh, pedagogy that we went through. And that defined why I danced. I danced for myself. I did not dance to please anybody else. That was the beginning point, I think, for me. That dance was always seen as offering. And it was always seen as something that you do for yourself and to refine your own soul. It was not so much seen as a performing art, in quotes. It's only my subsequent teachers who made me realize that there was another aspect to the dance, which is the performance aspect, the performative aspect, and what performance meant, and how you would do certain thing when you went on stage, and how the whole stage was a space which really could be a huge creative space which you could use. So I think the combination of that and this both together is what defines why I dance. I dance even today. My philosophy is to dance for yourself and at the same time to be relevant. I feel that's very important. To be relevant is, I think, something that I feel very strongly about because if we come on stage with the attitude that um, this is an you know an ancient art form that I have practiced, I have kept alive, and uh, uh, you better see it, that kind of an attitude really doesn't help. So I think it's all about staying relevant, staying having the context right, 
So that's why I dance. So I think you pick up the vocabulary, you pick up the grammar, and then you infuse that with your own understanding, intelligence, your intellectual capacity, and your contemporariness, and I think your aesthetics, and your concerns. So all this needs to be poured into the, the technique that you have learned, the communication tool that you have in your hand. All this then makes for a statement of yours through the dance. So I think why we dance, that's why I say is very important because it's not as though it's a habit to go to the class and you just do a routine kind of thing and you take it as an activity. I think dance is much more than that. Dance can really change your inner scape. It can really nurture you through life. It's something that is, is, is a personal tool that you have with you, which can take you through the highs and lows of your life. So then that brings me to the second aspect as to what is the possibility with dance? Why do we learn dance? Is it only to perform? I think this performance is the smallest part of learning dance. It is a stress buster. It is a physical activity that brings grace and aesthetics into your life. It brings in poetry, mythology, philosophy, spirituality into your life. It introduces you to the introduces you to the best of Indian traditions and Indian culture. It 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 brings you very close to rhythm, to music, to melody. So I think there's so many things, and what with with one aspect which which uh, you know kind of appeals to you most, you enter the dance form. For some, it is rhythm. For some, it is aesthetics. For some others, it is the the, the whole strong element of the dance that 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 brings you close to the dance. So I think dance is so much to offer that I think we tend to look at it as just a performance uh, tool. And I'm sorry, that is uh, for me, I think at least in my institute, that is the smallest thing. It's very important to make dance part of your life. I think that's the challenge. If the teacher can inspire you to make dance part of you, part of your whole being, I think that then becomes much more meaningful than looking for performances all the time and wanting to perform. Of course, performance is important. It is at the end of the day a performing art and you need to share what you've learned. But beyond that, if you want to stay connected, I think it's very important to understand all aspects and the possibilities that the art can do to you as a person and make you evolve as a person. And for that, you need to engage with a larger canvas of the dance and not just with learning pieces and items, which I'm very sorry to say has become the norm today of acquiring more and more and not really internalizing what you already know and to try and do something differently in a piece that you already know like the back of your palm. So I think these are some of the things that I would say as to why we learn dance and why we dance. The next question that I would like to take is, is dance reflecting who the dancer is? Many, many times I feel that earlier when I used to go uh, and watch the season in Chennai or something like that, there was always something that you look forward to because there was a certain Motoswami Pillai style or there was a Pandanalur style or there was a Varugur style or there was a Kalakshetra style and you went into the hall expecting a certain um, what would it, uh, what should I say? A certain uh, kind of dance, a certain uh, emphasis on certain elements that you knew was the strong point of that particular gharana of that particular style. So you saw five, six dances and you said, wow, look at the range and the variety. It's so lovely. It's so, so varied. And yet it's the same dance form that is being articulated in so many different beautiful ways. The, uh, I think, the, as you say in a language, 
the the dialect you know each of them speaking differently it's the same thing we had dialects but unfortunately today i think we don't have dialects we have one way of looking at dance one way of watching dance one way of performing dance one way of looking how you should be looking uh, on stage so i think where is the dancer where is the style and what is it that i know i should expect when i go and see you which is built over a period of time what is it because each of our grades stands for something you know there is something unique in them which you go to see i think that is very important for us to see what is it in my dance that is unique that i need to build on that i need to kind of strengthen take it forward and consistently work at it because what i see today is one dancer suddenly looks a certain way the next season she looks completely different because she is suddenly kind of exposed to something else and we don't know something else has happened and then the next year maybe she goes where is the consistency where is that graph which i can see in a dancer staying with a guru or saying with a style or whatever it is i'm i'm not talking about those nitpicks here but i must see a consistency i must see a certain evolution of a kind of vocabulary a certain kind of cerebral movement a certain kind of evolution in the philosophy of the dance and a core understanding of the dance which is not negotiable that core understanding is something that is like the trunk of a tree branches yes might move that way this way but the trunk is the core understanding of the dance your basic vocabulary your basic uh, what should i say um, basic engagement with dance which is, which which cannot kind of you know move here and there so i think that's very important uh, as you move in your dance journey you might be exposed to a workshop here or something there something there because today workshop it's become like the norm to go to workshops if you have attended 20 workshops even better but we didn't come from a workshop tradition we came from a certain guru shishya parampara tradition so i'm not against workshops please go do but really synthesize that into what you already know and try and add layers to it rather than sticking that out as a piece that you have learned in a workshop you need to integrate technique you need to integrate the whole philosophy of the workshop into what you are already doing it cannot be one of something that you pick up and you know kind of keep it uh, somewhere and not really integrate it into what you do so that's i think the second point which is where is the dancer in the dance i want to know where is the dancer so i'm always looking for if i see a young dancer i i like it if her herself is in the dance you know a bit of herself is in the dance i want to see that that is what makes her then stand out in the crowd is dance becoming boring and if so why i think it's a very important question because very many times i am told that you know classical doesn't interest us it's so boring it's the same thing being done over and over again and we don't understand it is very esoteric so i have always got to kind of say that we all need to understand that the whole idea of entertaining oneself has changed earlier in a household where there was a wedding it was always a kacheri even in my house today it's the dance floor even the grandmother is dancing away great grandmother is dancing on the dance floor this is a reality this is a reality and today if you have a spare evening you don't think of going to a dance program or a music program or a or a theater or something like that but you want to go to the mall and chill so this is the reality in which our dance is working or it's trying to find its place and these are realities so as dancers 
we always complain that why people don't come and watch dance but are we addressing all these changes that have happened around us and trying to see what are we doing to still attract them and make them come to the auditorium what can we do i am not talking about trivializing the art and making it pop i'm not saying that i'm just saying that is there any way where we can raise the bar and not perform too many times perform maybe once or twice a year with full focus on that program and try and come up with something really different something that is meaningful something that has a lot of work that has gone into it in depth so i think the uh, for me like many times i ask my student who say ki oh there is no audience we don't you know we perform it. i said uh, why should i come and watch your program or why should i buy a ticket and watch your program what is the usp in you what is the unique selling proposition in your program have you thought about it give me five things as to why i should buy a ticket and come and watch your program we need to think ourselves we are many dancers with few opportunities but are we raising the bar of the dance i don't think so i don't think so exceptional work in dance is very very few so i think we need to think about how we can raise the bar of our dancing so that people are compelled to come and watch so i think there is no shortcut in this because we are in the marketplace competing with earlier it was maybe one or two things we are now competing with 200 300 things in order to be heard or seen so we need to really think as to where we can make those interventions and make dance today a meaningful evening where people feel gratified after watching the dance we need to think there are no easy solutions to this i am not saying that but we need to think instead of just grumbling that people are not coming to the auditorium we need to introspect we need to see what is it we have the best possible grammar technique everything but there's some something that is not happening right where or maybe we are not more we should need we need to be more organized we need to be more connected we need to be more focused and understand what the marketplace is like and what is it that we would be because there's no fighting shy of this market forces we cannot kind of say this is a reality we cannot say or oh, go and perform in the temple if you are in the marketplace competing and you are there wanting to tell sell tickets and make this an economic model then we need to see the back end as to what is it that really can make that difference and make people come to the auditorium this is something that we all need to brainstorm maybe another session where you need to think about this and see how you can go about it so as of now dance is boring sorry to be but saying the the truth that very many times i feel difficult to sit through a program many times because i just feel that it's kind of becoming jaded it's kind of becoming very cliched it's kind of becoming very predictable we need to bring in much more creativity into it much more fantastic content into it which can be of relevance it's not that you need to take up female feticide and you need to take up drugs i'm not talking about that all things are extremely contemporary but you need to put it in a frame which is effective which is intelligent so it's not about i'm not saying that you need to be contemporary in terms of issues many of the older pieces can be revisited today and be contextualized they need to be put into context and made relevant so i think that journey is very very important for all of us to do excellence what is excellence in dance very many times i am asked this question you talk about excellence what do you think is the excellence i think excellence is for me 
that you are not many times when i go to a dance i find that the dancer herself is bored with the pieces because she's over rehearsed now in order to be perfect do you put everything in a box and close it i don't think that is that is necessary excellence is when you keep things open there has to be manodharma there has to be understanding of music there has to be awareness of your surroundings there has to be a sensitivity that goes beyond technique so i think these things are extremely intangible but the most important when you talk about excellence so many of the the, the parameters that were used earlier for excellence have been replaced with slim figure um uh, a slick performance um uh, uh what else did i say a, a communicative performance where earlier it used to be maybe musicality um grace a certain style now all that is seen as something not relevant so maybe for me excellence is these things you know things which are intangible but things which actually make a difference so excellence need to be you need to aspire for that excellence who are your role models who are you looking up to who are the people you watch i still watch some dancers i don't want to name a few to add so that you know i i kind of belittle the others i watch them and i can watch them again and again there's so much of repeat value in a dance performance balama had that you missed something last time you you see it again you said oh why didn't i catch this last time but dancers today i find have no repeat value i've seen it once oh, i've seen it you know i don't need to kind of see it again i've seen it and they do it exactly the same way anyway so i think that of repeat value of every time doing it a fresh a new and that is very very important that quality is what is the quality of excellence the mano dharma and the, the the sensitivity with which you you address a piece each time the singer changes your dance changes the mridangis changes your dance changes at least for me that happens because the energy that you get from a certain musician is a certain way and the energy you get from a certain uh, mridangis is a certain way so your dance suddenly changes so are we aware of what is happening around us what is the sangadi that he is singing can i improvise on that and can i bring that nuance into dance he is not singing it the same way same time same way every time he is he is bringing in different nuances am i able to translate those nuances amritangis while you know particularly my teacher used to say while going back the amritangis is playing different kinds of nadais are you reacting to that are you aware of that are you, is your body reacting to it you might not move but your body reacts the soul is reacting to it so is that sensitivity there i think that's very important to catch i mean these are the intangibles i think which cannot be taught in a sense i guess which you just need to kind of imbibe by watching your teacher or watching the process of the teacher or uh, i don't know from where you can get these inputs but i think these are important to me so i i'm here to talk about what i feel is important in dance so that's why i'm sharing this the next is how do you train and has the pedagogy of dance evolved with time i think very important topic very close to my heart because i for me pedagogy is constantly evolving and i do the tayyati class also i i don't take only the seniors so i stay connected with generation next and i see their strengths and i need to learn a lot and unlearn a lot when i teach the next generation because they come with a set of skills which are very different from the skills maybe you and i had when we began learning dance so their skills are different and they don't have certain skills which maybe we had so the pedagogy constantly needs to address these issues also to be a professional dancer today 
the qualities that are required are very different from a few years back maybe you need to communicate you need to really understand the pieces place them in context you need to understand the 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 whole history of when the piece was written what was that and i think that's placing it in context becomes very important you need to have understanding of lighting of costume of orchestra of musicians of a whole lot of things skills maybe which maybe earlier uh, may not have been important but today is very important and that's i think comes as part of pedagogy because many of many of you many of the students may be become choreographers tomorrow many of them might become light technicians tomorrow because my my from my class i think i have dance therapy to dance education to sound and light uh, specialist because we expose them to everything and they choose what they want to want to do and many of them do psychology and then they do dance therapy because then they can combine both the skills so i think today the need is where the pedagogy exposes you to a large um, canvas as i say and then you can see where you fit in and where you want to take it because everybody cannot become a performer let's face it becoming a performer is a challenge that place is extremely extremely crowded so we need to see that the passion for the arts you retain it in very many different ways and it can be done and dance education is just, is something that i am very working very closely with many of my students and it's so gratifying to see how we can integrate dance in education so i think there's so many areas that one is interested in and one can bring in the arts because we unfortunately the pedagogy is still to create solo dancers and i think that is very myopic we need to make the pedagogy much uh, much richer in terms of mythology in terms of storytelling in terms of iconography in terms of uh, um, symbolism i think we need to go into every area so that then you have people who are rounded and then they choose what they want to do with the art form so i think that's uh, very very important i think i've spoken a lot i don't know um so uh, reshma you need to guide me now how do you want to take this forward yes yes okay yes okay okay So why don't you ask your questions first? uh yeah it's uh, trends have become kind of uh, uh, because of the social media i think the uh, trends have kind of caught on 
and uh, people want to jump onto the bandwagon and kind of say that uh, oh you've done this i can do this even uh, even better or i can do it a certain way um i guess now how in it if it is um, if you, if you're coming up with something that is meaningful and you have something to say that is uh, organic in a sense that if you have been working on it and it's something that has come very organically but if you're doing it because the other one is doing it and uh, you feel you also will be left behind if you don't do it i think that um, i think for me uh, it doesn't work and it doesn't uh, you know then it, it doesn't have a life of its own these are all things that ani jani for they say you know coming and going it's not really there to stay and it's not something maybe people are thinking of of things that can be marketed because alaripu workshop or you know you're teaching a thing alaripu becomes an easy thing to teach and it's a small piece so you feel it, it you know it's because it's very structured it's very easy to teach something like that so maybe people are looking for modules which you know are easy to uh, teach online or teach uh, anybody because i seriously feel when you're doing a workshop uh you are actually sharing pieces which you have worked on for a long time and maybe in your career you have done that piece when you were in your 40s now when you are teaching that piece for me it's very painful if i have a beginner learning that piece or a person who's not even done a rarangetram or doesn't understand the vocabulary wanting to attempt that piece so who am i giving the piece i think for me is very important so but in a workshop you don't have control over all that you are teaching a piece to whoever comes or maybe you audition and you say a certain whatever it is and what happens to that piece after that is also you have no control over because it's not as though they come back to you and show you the piece that we have worked on it and you know would you like to see the piece and kind of tell us give us some inputs even that doesn't happen in a workshop thing you just teach the piece and it's gone and you just give it so i think uh, it's a different kind of mindset because i create pieces for my own students as legacy so you know then what is the idea of having students you know if all and sundry are going to be performing the same item or the same number then the whole thing of legacy where does it come you know and what is what is the role of legacy so i think i still have pieces by my teachers which i carry with me as my legacy my legacy is that so i think that uh, for me yes these trends i think are um, it's okay i don't mind them because i just feel social media needs something because uh, people don't have content you see people don't have too much uh, content so they create content by seeing others or by copying something that they feel is working for that person but not realizing whether it will work for you you have to see what works for you ultimately it might work for that person but it might might not necessarily work for you so i think this needs a dialogue with your teacher or with your guru much more dialoguing is important and uh, uh, i'll also shoot my second question while the audience gets ready so this is maybe something on similar terms uh, the past two years of the pandemic like you said all of us have learned to go online and then suddenly we see there is this explosion of uh, information uh, there is an explosion of like you said online workshops online classes online performers and uh, have you felt that also there's there is this uh, let's say online casual dancing because everyone is now a youtube dancer there are these uh, 30 second dances uh, which may not be let's say um, grammar or vocabulary uh, which fits into let's say the tradition that uh, we all have seen and we have experienced so that that casual dancing have have you seen that it's not casual it's not dancing and dancing, dancing you know and uh, maybe it works for the for the 30 minute thing and your likes going up and your um, you know uh, your uh, you becoming i, I see that uh, many of the people who are um, not necessarily classical dancers but uh, do many many things are, are influencers in uh, uh, so i think the ones who are doing serious dancing have this feeling that oh we are left out 
you know, these kinds of people are the ones who are uh, being, um, but I think we need to understand that social media is not the ultimate. It cannot, in a say, in a sense, translate into programs necessarily. You know, the mainstreaming and of programs, you have to be at the end of the day, be able to do a varnam. You have to be able to sustain uh, a, a two and a half hour concert. There is no getting away from it. Your 30 minute thing, I think many of these people wouldn't even know a margam, right? So I feel uh, this is all like, you know, entertainment. You just watch it for fun and, you know, you say fantastic. But there is a danger in it because many of your, our so-called organizers are ill-informed. And they are being influenced by these influencers. They feel popularity in the social media is very important when you are booking the person for a particular. This is I'm talking about a certain kind of organizers who are not into in-depth understanding of the arts, who have, have a very, very peripheral knowledge of the arts, but certainly are being influenced by these kind of people who have a huge following. So we have to guard against that, where they don't make a mainstream because of these two minute uh, noodle, two minute instant gratification stuff that they do. They cannot be really mainstream dancers unless they prove themselves as uh, serious dancers with, as I said, having a capacity or a capability of dancing uh, serious dance. Yes, sir. Uh, so let me just go to the audience now because we have a question from Rasika. Rasika, you could please uh, unmute and uh, shoot, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, Rita, ma'am, I'm following you on uh, Vidya Mitra YouTube channels. Uh, I I found this channel during lockdown <laughs> and uh, trying to learn some of your you know great techniques to learn the basics. So while I was learning, uh, I was also get bombarded with lots of Instagram reels. Uh, as you just mentioned that there is a lot of speed and kind of gymnastic kind of movements regarding the adult presentation, especially and uh, Larry Puyven. And uh, suddenly I started feeling that am I going too slow and I'm not that much capable to, you know, uh, catch my audience attraction that going and you know suddenly they are doing again they are doing some again different ado and you know and then people are clapping so uh, do, do you have any comment uh, regarding this thank you so much it's a very very uh, good question because uh, i think this is this is exactly the problem that many dancers have self doubt seeing these two minute stuff and suddenly somebody is showing, showing, showing off their stamina by doing Mandi Adavu for 10 minutes, you know. So, uh, I mean, I just feel that this, I talked about the trunk. I talked about the core understanding of the arts, which comes by staying with a teacher or a guru or an acharya for many years. And that philosophy towards the arts has to be a full of conviction, something that you have full faith and conviction in. So that which is not rattled by all these seasonal things and by trends and by all kinds of things. The path and the goal has to be very, very precise as to where you're heading and what you want to do and what you're capable of doing and what is your goal and aim. I think that is this this focus is very very important and I think lack of gurus lack of trusting your guru I think has become a huge casualty here and that um, the guru is also watching all this and I am not one of those who says I'll be out of this game of insta I'm not going to be in insta I'm I, I think this doesn't matter I think everything matters I am there watching everything and yet I feel I can be relevant with my art I can you know, give a sense of direction to my students and say that in this kind of a competitive, highly um, physical, uh, physically exacting dance that is happening, 
you can still bring in a soft, gentle piece which moves a person. It's about how you do it and how you attempt a piece and how you bring how much of technique and soul you bring into a piece. So this kind of dazzling is always possible. You dazzle like it's my gurus used to always say you can you can you know climb up very quickly, but are you do you have enough material to stay there? Yeah. So you know the point is challenge is to stay there. So you might have a meteoric thing. I'm saying there are seasonal things. Every season you have a new name coming, and then you don't know where that name is going. So I think that sustained kind of understanding of dance, sustained work in a particular direction. You have to have a clear direction and vision for your art, and that comes with a teacher, with a guru. You know, it's very stylish to say I'm on my own nowadays. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to be on your own, but I think somewhere you need somebody to tell you this works and this doesn't work. It's not that everything you uh, think works or you pick up from a workshop works for you. So a teacher is the third eye. She's the, the she or he is the one watching you constantly and guiding you and saying this works for you. This doesn't work for you. This sits on your body. This doesn't sit on your body. Maybe your intellectual capacity is of a different kind. You need to focus on something else. So I think these kinds of things uh, you have to. There is no way that you can kind of travel this whole journey without a teacher. You Thank need. You. Reshma, Reshma, may I interrupt? Lavanya here. Ma'am, thank you so much. That was a wonderful session. I have a question. Am I audible? Yes, 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 Lavanya. I'm just outside with a lot of background noise. Pardon me for that. Uh, Ma'am, uh, like, uh, we should definitely hear you sing. You know, how much singing is very important for a dancer. We, uh, like, uh, as uh, the person who asked me the question before me was uh, uh, saying about the Vidya Mitra, I'm a great fan of yours and a great fan of your singing. So, Please, ma'am, would you like to sing and show a couple of Abhinaya for us? It would be great. Feast to the eyes and feast to the ears. <laughs> okay, I'll do that in the end after taking all the questions, maybe. How much uh -oh. time do we have, uh, Reshma? Okay, okay, okay. Are there any more questions? Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, uh, I do some yoga regularly. I feel like, uh, you know, uh, naturally I feel like uh, I'm getting bored of doing yoga and I feel like dance is much more better and like, I don't know why. I I just want to know, like, uh, what is the difference between uh, Hatha Yoga and uh, dance, like classical Bharatanatyam or any other classical dance? And also, uh, what would be good for one's spiritual journey? Ah, well, uh, yoga is a, a wonderful uh, uh, way of connecting and staying connected with yourself because I myself practice yoga. Um, but dance is, I think, um, um, something that brings many more elements because uh, it has music, it has, as I said, it has mythology, yeah, the compositions have a certain mood, then you have complete technique which uh, grounds you and which connects you with uh, Mother Earth and you have this connect. Um, uh, so I think dance has many more elements than yoga. And it brings together all these aspects and it makes you much more aware of your senses and it, it just wakens you up in a sense, you know. So, so I think dance is uh, a wider um, understanding of so many elements that are beautiful in, 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 in Indian culture. So yoga is always very helpful for dance. And in one spiritual journey, I, I don't think there is one size that fits all everybody comes from a different space from a different kind of a process of evolution so i think you need to see what works for you 
and um, what um, you know connects you because for some people just sitting in meditation works for somebody else you know dance is their form of connecting um, um, with the spiritual for some others it can just be doing house chore that is extremely meditative and it has that de-stressing quality about it so i think for each one we need to find out what works for each one of us so i i don't think for me dance works i can tell you that particularly dancing um uh, with no no programs or no stakes is the best because you're just in a practice session and you're just working and you're perform i mean practicing for yourself that is i think the most meditative time when you don't have a deadline you don't necessarily have to complete a piece or create a piece but you just dance because you are just wanting to connect so i think those are moments when you really feel that this vocabulary and this whole process is extremely helpful to you as a person and it you just come alive you know uh, you might be very low but suddenly you dance and you are in another space and you are you know jumping around so so i think it just can you know lift you up uh, very quickly so that's my mechanism of kind of staying happy and staying positive so everybody has to find their own medium there's nothing that i can say will work for you because i don't know you and what is your you know inclination towards uh, that but yoga is a, is is also a beautiful way of connecting thank you ma'am ma'am we we'll take one last question probably uh, girija ma'am would would you like to go yes please um girija ma'am we do see your comment um, please go ahead um we can't hear you Okay. So there is a chat uh, from Girija Ravindranath uh, from Kerala. She wanted to ask a question, but um, we don't seem to hear her. Has she put it on the chat? No, no. no. Yes, now I'm. Yes, here. she's here. Go on, ma'am. Namaste. Uh, I'm not a performer. I'm a teacher. I also had the a uh, good fortune to take a few classes for reshma um uh, i want to just uh, add and ask your opinion about uh, you said about just now you were saying about dance and yoga and how it makes you feel whole uh, i want to add to that saying that i am a teacher i feel the same when i see my students dance so beautiful it is it is extremely beautiful i i just thought i should share this because yes i i don't i'm not on stage i only yes. teach yes but then uh, this this when i see sometimes they make me cry yes you know in class even the small ones the ones yes. who do the other ones yes. i i just wanted to share that i i no, totally very, agree with it it's very true only the other day you know they were grappling with uh, just the shoulder movement of the alaripu my little ones okay. and you know this you know how tough it is it's such a stylized yes. movement that um, they struggle with it so I, when they did it right last class i was like wow one battle <laughs> you know it's so beautiful yes. and to see those little ones do that stylized movement was so beautiful yes. and to 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 actually make them understand that a subtle movement can make such a beautiful picture itself was yes. so beautiful because you don't need large movements that's why i'm saying sometimes you know this whole thing of making dance so rigorous and so uh full of um, um very demanding movements sometimes takes away because i'm sitting at the edge of the chair almost not really relaxing and watching the dance so i just feel that quality of reposefulness and of the emotive quality in the dance we need to bring back that into dance you know that is the essence of the dance 
that is the the the, the yogic or the, or the meditative quality of the dance you know so exactly how much ever you 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 marvel at the physical you know dexterity of the dancer you do still look for that moment that makes you cry that makes you connect you know so so sometimes in music for example you stay in a note and that's what works not your sangadis and your mathematical yeah. calculations but staying <laughs> in a note you know just staying in a note it it just makes gives you goosebumps you know yeah very good thank you thank, thank you. you very much thank you so much ma'am uh, so we'll come to lavanya's request uh, a collective request from all of us and uh, what i'll also do is i'm just going to go ahead and say thank you to you because i don't want my voice uh, to come in and end the session so let let's let your voice uh, linger uh, while we end the evening uh, so members of icda guests thank you so much for joining us uh, geeta ma'am thank you for today's session your thoughts your ideas thank you, you really influence us thank you so much ma'am thank you over to swam <coughs> so polikriyani varnam taught to me by dandai uh, pandi pillai's younger brother shamukisa and uh, i also teach it so i just thought i'll do a little bit of that swami gave shuladi sakhi ge kumar swami gave
thank you so thank much you. ma'am beautiful wonderful ma'am thank you so much thank you so much thank you